Hello and welcome to another video by Pale Blue Thoughts. I had started a video series earlier titled Ayurveda, the Holistic Pseudoscience, where I promised that I will expose the horrors that are actually written in the ancient texts of Ayurveda. I had done a video on it, which I'm sure you have watched. So let me continue with the series, albeit after a long break. If you want to refresh your memory, the link is there in the description. I had just scratched the surface of Ayurveda in that and I intend to go a little deeper into its pseudoscientific principles this time. After watching this video till the end, I will leave you to form your opinion about this form of ancient medical system. In this video, I will expose the pseudoscientific principles which underlines Ayurveda and then you can see for yourself why this form of treatment is outdated and fit for a history music. It's a pity that this outdated system is still taught in colleges and thousands of brainwashed students pass out every year from these colleges. Such a waste of human resources. Anyways, welcome to my channel and welcome to Ayurveda for Dummies edition. So let's start the music. Now, when I released my last video criticizing Ayurveda, the most common response was that I was misquoting from the book or that I am reading a mistranslated version. <laughs> so I'm going to show you the references which I'm using here on the screen. If you feel there is an issue with the translation, please contact the original writers of this book. I shall be showing the relevant parts from these books as I explain the topics. Now, as I mentioned in the intro, let's get into the basics of Ayurveda. There are eight branches of Ayurveda. Kaya Chigilsa, which is a pseudoscientific version of general medicine. Bala Chigilsa, pediatrics. Bhuta Vidya or Graha Chigilsa is psychiatry. Please note the words Bhut and Graha here, which indicates how they considered psychiatric diseases were caused. Urdhvanga Chigilsa, also known as Salakya Tantra, diseases and treatment of ear, nose, throat, eyes and head. Basically, this portion of our body. Shalya Chikilsa is surgery. Damsha Chikilsa or Agatha Tantra, which is basically toxicology, the study of poisons and its effects. Vrishya Chikilsa or Vajikarna Chikilsa, which is the famous and most funny of them all, aphrodisiac therapy or diseases which affect the reproductive system. And last but not the least, Dasayana Chikilsa, which is the branch of medicine dealing with rejuvenation of health and well being. Again, quite funny because it explains how people can stay young without getting old. I think this is one branch which has worked well in Ayurveda because up until a century ago, the average lifespan of people who were brought up under Ayurveda used to be around 24 to 25 years. Majority of the people died young and never got old. So I should say this one worked for sure. Don't you think so? So moving on, the core of Ayurveda focuses on two aspects called Swastavrta and Adravrta. Swastavrta deals with what you should do to keep yourself healthy and disease free and Adravrta deals with the treatment methods in case the Swastavrta methods fail and you fall sick. So the first one is prevention and the latter is supposed to be the cure. The backbone of Ayurveda are the Panjabhutas, an ancient notion that all substances in this world including our bodies are made up of five basic elements, earth, fire, water, air and sky. Of course, at that time they didn't know that the air and sky were the same thing, so they included them as separate. The Greeks knew this, so they had only four elements and omitted the sky. Today some people try to paint a pretty picture by saying sky is actually space and all that jazz, but we will see why it means sky itself in a little while. Anyway, so how did they come up with this five humor theory? Simple. They just equated our five sense elements to things that they could sense around them. For instance, earth has a smell, fire can be seen, air can be felt and the sky. Oh, the sky makes sound, right? Haven't you heard thunder, my friend? Now they have gone another step ahead and given qualities to these elements. After that, they have classified each substance on the basis of the dominance of these qualities. If something is light, then it is predominantly air or vayu. If something is cold, then it has to be water dominant and so on. A completely wrong notion of classification of substances and yet this forms the basis of Ayurveda even today. Take the example of something cold, say ice creams, liquid nitrogen, dry ice. These are super cold substances but does not contain water. Well, 
Ayurvedas could justify it by saying there is water in the milk from which ice creams are made and liquid nitrogen still says liquid and that is what Ayurveda actually means. But what about dry ice, a solid substance? They just took the properties of one thing and have thrust it on other things without thinking too much. Simple pattern seeking in action, however they couldn't recognize that the patterns that they were seeking were false ones. Today we know that substances are not made up of these five elements. They got the very basics wrong. It is like this. When you're building something, the foundation has to be the strongest. If not, you could build whatever on top of it, but they won't last. Similarly, since the foundation of Ayurveda is incorrect, all that would come after this would follow the same pattern. We will see those now. Now what makes Ayurveda Ayurveda is the Tridosha principle, the famous trio of Vata, Pitta and Kapha. If you remove these, there will no longer be any Ayurveda. But it's simply a very wrong concept. And yet, you cannot have Ayurveda without this. According to its theory, diseases are caused due to imbalance of these three non-existent things. When they are in balance, you are healthy. But when there is an increase or decrease in Vata, Pitta or Kapha or a combination of these, you get diseased. Till date, no one knows what exactly these are but the texts mention where they are located in the body nonetheless. First it says that it is distributed all over the body, then to be more precise by the looks of things, they are said to be concentrated in specific areas of the body. If you divide the body into three parts, the top part up to chest is dominated by Kapha Dosha, between the chest and umbilicus is dominated by Pitta, below umbilicus part is dominated by Vata. And not just that, they have divided the day into times when each dosha would be dominant. During day and night, the first part is dominated by kapha, the second part is dominated by pitta and third part is dominated by vata. It details in length about how each one looks like, feels like and even tastes like. The irony however is that no one has even seen it, felt it or tasted it. Simply because they never existed. They also mention the qualities of each one. Goodness knows how. Vata is associated with the element air and hence associated with movement. It is also mentioned as being cold or shita. However, you need to realize that no part of the body is cold and the temperature is maintained all throughout the body in the same manner. Except of course the male testis which is situated technically slightly outside for keeping it a couple of degrees down. So the qualities attributed is also wrong. Other qualities all indicates a material object like roughness, dryness, movement etc. and it is situated in the lower abdomen. But we know that there is no such thing present as we have a better understanding of the human anatomy these days. Pitta is associated with Agni of fire and is supposed to be slightly oily, hot, has a bad smell and is in liquid form. There is no such thing in reality between the chest and the umbilicus as per today's understanding. Kapha is supposed to be white, slimy, cool and believe it or not, sweet in taste. Now which body part is supposed to be sweet? I don't know. So basically the sages who wrote these texts have used a lot of imagination to give all these attributes to non-existent things that I am sure they wouldn't have seen in their lives. But the irony is that these non-existent Vata, Pitta and Kapha are what causes diseases and treatments are based on regulating these. Remember what I said earlier about how if the foundation is not right, the rest is just useless? I repeat that again here. If you try and explain anything on the basis of things which don't exist, it would be a futile exercise. It is just like writing ghost stories, makes an interesting read and good for a scare but is practically useless. Along with the Tridoshas, there is another material which is supposed to be very important and that is blood. Of course, it is easier to pen down the properties of blood as even you can write about it as you would have seen it at some point for sure. And I am sure you must have tasted your own blood at some point in your life. But did it taste sweet as described in the Samhita? You are the better judge. The text then goes into a very lengthy elaboration of what happens when there is an imbalance or increase and decrease of these doshas. A lot of pages wasted since Vata, Pitta and Kapha don't really exist. Next comes another comedy, the description of bodily principles of Dadus. Apparently they are seven in number. They are Rasa, Rakta, Mamsa, Medha, 
asti majja and shukra but what makes it comedy is that the text tell us about how they are formed and in which order according to the samhitas the food that you eat get converted to rasa modern interpretations equate it to plasma but there's a problem here plasma is something which comes out of the blood when it gets centrifuged and it doesn't come from food but the text then says rasa turns into blood how could this be true plasma is supposed to come from blood and not the other way around but the sages thought otherwise the comedy doesn't stop here from blood forms mamsa what we call as muscle now i'm sure any school going child would know that this is not true the muscle then turns into maida or fat and believe it or not fat turns into asti bones had enough no bones form bone marrow now let us pause here and analyze this the bone marrow is a spongy tissue found in the cavities of certain bones especially the long bones like the femur tibia and humerus the formation of blood also called as hematopoiesis occurs in the bone marrow this is the current knowledge but in ayurveda blood comes from rasa which comes from food the blood later takes the form of muscle fat bones and then forms the bone marrow complete ulta of what actually happens modern knowledge says that blood is formed in the bone marrow but in ayurveda blood forms the bone marrow i mean wow just wow मारो मुझे मारो मारो मुझे मारो मारो नहीं ये मजाक हो रहा है एक सेकंड यार मजाक हो रहा है एंड दिस इज व्हाट इज टॉट टू स्टूडेंट्स इवन टुडे एंड फाइनली फ्रॉम द बोन मैरो कम्स शुक्र सीम एंड इट स्प्रेड ऑल ओवर द बॉडी समथिंग व्हिच ऑफ फिट ट्यूबर कीप्स कोटिंग इन हिज वीडियोस ऑल द टाइम कंपेयर दिस विद टुडेस अंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑफ हाउ एंड वेयर द ह्यूमन सीम इज लोकेटेड बाय द वे आई हैव अ डाउट इफ शुक्र इज प्रेजेंट ऑल ओवर द बॉडी देन व्हाट अबाउट वुमेन Of course Ayurveda doesn't talk about women in its texts as it is very misogynistic but it is a simple doubt of mine Ayurveda talks of semen in lot of places but doesn't mention the ovum even once instead it says that when the semen mixes with the menstrual blood listen carefully when the semen mixes with menstrual blood it results in pregnancy ah the wisdom of great sages <sighs> now where does menstrual blood come from did you say rakta Oh no 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 seven times no menstrual blood comes from rasa according to ayurveda by the way the breast milk too comes from this rasa and the skin comes from muscles it's not me saying all this it's the wisdom of sages handed down generation to generation anyways moving on the text now talks about malas waste products from the body i won't go into too detail as it is a stinky subject but we'll stick to some of the comedies mentioned there As per the sages perspiration is the excreted matter of fat nails and hair are the excreted portions of the bones and those waxy deposits found in the corners of the eyes well they are the excreted portions of bone marrow got it if i tell a 5 year old today that nails and hair are waste products released by bones he would ask kaun hai ye log kahan se aate hain Last but not the least is ojas which is supposed to be the essence of these dhatus and it is some kind of life force which makes us alive it is present mainly in the heart but also all over the body i don't know why ayurveda is hesitant to say something exists in one place but instead it always says it's all over the body so ojas too like everything else that we saw today is a thing not existing but the sages have made detailed description of it It is supposed to be transparent and yet yellowish white in color like ghee but it tastes like honey and smells like believe it or not roasted rice how very precise modern ayurvedic websites does this go one step further and equate it to something that stimulates the sinoatrial node which is the natural pacemaker of the heart they have found the exact quantity too eight drops how do they get all this information about something which doesn't exist never ceases to amaze me so let me pause here for today as i'm sure you're already rolling on the floor laughing too much laughter will bring your vata down and increase your kapha and i don't want to do that so this is what is written in the ancient ayurvedic texts that we hold in high esteem figments of imagination like the panjabudas tridoshas and ojas 
I have to admit that Datus are there, but the order of their formation as written in the text is completely wrong. This is what undiluted, unadulterated, pure 916 Ayurveda looks like. This is what thousands of students learn in Ayurveda colleges each year. So if you are a student wanting to become a doctor, please don't choose this path. If you lose out getting a medical seat due to a few marks, study hard and attempt it next year instead of settling for unscientific courses like Ayurveda, Siddha, Yunani or Homeopathy. Because if you do join these courses, these are the things that you would have to learn. Unlearning is not an easy task. Crores of taxpayers' money goes to fund these courses and the so-called research that the Ayurvedas conduct. They just buy hard these slokas and copy paste it on their answer papers and get marks. They learn about things that don't exist and they don't question it. They are brainwashed like zombies and then come out and become Ayurveda practitioners. Some would realize their folly but they don't have a choice now. It is called sunk cost fallacy. They have already invested a lot of money time and effort and even when it is clear that the future benefits or returns are not worth the continued investment they continue to stick on to outdated methods and then some of them come under the comment section of channels like mine or sciences dope or under liver doctors twitter handle and play keyboard barriers trying to defend their unfounded beliefs ayurveda is more like a religion in this country touch it and sentiments get hurt and this is mainly because the system originated here. Many of the people have a nationalistic love for it. As I mentioned in my previous video, there is a big difference between being nationalistic and being patriotic. Our culture, like any other culture, would have a lot of good and a lot of bad. Embrace the good and discard the bad. This pseudoscientific form of treatment relies on outdated concepts and imaginary constructs within the human body. The more you stay away from it, the more you will benefit. Your kidneys and liver would thank you. I will bring more horrors from these texts in future videos. Until then, it's bye bye from Pale Blue Thoughts. Khatam, bye bye, Tata, goodbye, Gaya.